never forget, my mother phoned me up one Friday night, and she says, can I come with you? And I said, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll pick you up on our way. So we go to pick up my mother, and when we arrive at her place, she comes out of the house, and she's wearing a fur coat and fishnet stockings. And I said, Mom, why are you dressed like that? She said, I thought we were going to minister to prostitutes. I wanted to blend in. I said, you don't blend in by looking like the oldest hooker on the street. <laughs> Welcome to Church of the Rock from Winnipeg. Stay tuned to this week's thought-provoking message from Pastor Mark Hughes. And we've been looking at this thing called the greater passion, which is so important to my heart. And we've been looking at the actual greater passions, which I told you were God, were your spouse, were your family, were your job, and a few other things. And we talked about some of the things that weren't our greater passions as well. And today my message is entitled, The Passionate Prevailer. And so at the end of Jesus' ministry, he did something interesting. You, you can go read about it. It's in Matthew chapter 24. And he gathered his disciples, not the crowd, he gathered his disciples on the Mount of Olives, and he started telling them about the end, the end of the world, and these cataclysmic things were going to happen, and these terrible things, and the things that they were going to end up suffering as a result. And then he said this. He said, if you will persevere to the end, then you will be saved. And what Jesus did often was, it was sort of fascinating, he was always looking to the end, and he was always looking to where they were going. He came for a purpose, he was looking towards the end. He knew that the only thing that was going to really help his disciples get through all of the persecution they were going to face was that if they saw the end game, if they knew what they were aiming at. And it's interesting because one of the greatest books of our generation, business books and inspirational books of our generation in the secular world, is Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. If you hadn't read it, I highly recommend you do. Easily in the top three, tremendous book. Anyway, habit number two is this, to begin with the end in, in mind. And he says that when you're going to do anything in life, you actually have to focus on the end, whatever it is. And the example he uses, of course, is building a house. And he says, if you're going to build a house, you don't just start hammering boards together. You actually have a plan, and you know what the house is going to look like before you start. You begin with the end in mind. But I want to get back to this beginning with the end in mind because it's so important for us when it comes to the gospel and when it comes to what we're supposed to do with our lives. And I always tell people this. It's a, it's a little bit dark, but I still think they should do it. I say, you should plan your funeral now. And of course, I'm not talking about the coffin or the flowers or the hearse you're going to have or the tombstone. What I'm talking about is plan what you would want people to say about you after you're gone. Because I'll tell you what they don't say at funerals, and I do a lot of them, and I'm there, and I know what happens. I'll tell you what people do. They don't get up here and talk about the car you drove and the house you owned and the job you had and the money you made. You know what? None of that stuff has any eternal value, and nobody talks about it at the end. The only thing they talk about at the end is the difference you made to the people around you in this world. That's all that really matters. You know, it reminds me of this, this story about these three guys, and they were at a funeral, and they were discussing what they would want someone else to say at their funeral. And the first guy said, I would want them to say he was a loving father and a faithful husband. The second one, a doctor said, I would want them to say he was a brilliant surgeon and saved many lives. The third one said, I would want them to look right into my casket and say, look, I think he's moving. <laughs> They're the eternal optimists, right? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go look at a little verse. And this is the story of what Paul said at the end, as he was passing from this world to the next. And it's so remarkable that we should all think about it. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, and it says this, For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So it's sort of an interesting story that Paul actually knew 
that his time was done. He says, my time of departure is at hand. I'm ready to go. And here's what I love about this story. He has no regrets. He's ready to go. Wouldn't you love to live your life with no regrets and to leave this world feeling that you had accomplished your task, your greater purpose in life? And then he, then he goes on and he says, I know this, that there is a crown of righteousness laid up for me and also for you. Uh, whenever I think about that, I think, what does this crown of righteousness look like? If it looks like a Burger King crown, I don't really want it. And there's something that we can all get as our inheritance when we go that is more precious than any crown or any jewels or any reward or any mansions in heaven, if there are mansions. And it's to hear these words, well done, good and faithful servant. And I know that if you look and, and search your own heart, that's what people want to hear. Well done, good and faithful servant. There is nothing that matters more than that. So what do I want to do is I want to look at this verse. He said three things here, and this is what I call the passionate prevailer. There are three characteristics of the passionate prevailer. I'm going to throw it up on your screen. And this is what they do. They fight the good fight, they finish the race, and they keep the faith. And there's something I want you to notice about this. Did you notice that he did not say that I won the good fight? He did not say, I won the race. He did not say, I triumphed in my faith. All he said was that he fought the good fight, he ran the race, and finished the race, and that he kept his faith. And you know, that's a little bit foreign to us, because we live in a triumphal culture, where people want to achieve, they want to be winners, they always want, you know, our whole culture is all geared towards winning and achieving and coming in first place. Well, not everybody can come in first place. It's just sort of a you know, law of numbers, really, and averages. And he says this. He said, no, this is what I did. He said, I fought the good fight, and I finished the race, and I kept my faith, and that's what matters. And I'm, I was thinking about this, and I, it reminded me of a story about when I was about 12 years old. We had these bullies. They lived right across the street, these two goofball brothers, big, huge, dumb bullies. That's all they were. There's no other way to describe them. And they were a couple years older than me. They were way bigger than me, and they're always pounding on me. And I was not a big kid growing up. And I remember one day they would kind of roughed me up a bit. And I came home, and I talked to my dad, and I said, the, the brothers across the street, they beat me up again today. So my dad gave me this advice. I'll never forget it. He says, all you have to do, Mark, is stand on their feet, and they'll fall right over. I said, what? He says, let me show you. Now, remember, my dad at that time, I'm 12 years old, my dad is at least twice as heavy as I am. He weighs like, you know, 100 pounds more than I do or more. And so he says, you just stand on their feet like this. And he stood on my feet and you push them and they'll fall right over. So he stands on my feet. He pushes me. And guess what? I fell right in the car carpet, right in the floor. So boom, I land on the floor and I got up and I thought, that's the most brilliant thing I've ever seen. <laughs> I just stand on his feet, push him over. They fall down. Job done. Now, here's my question for you. Do you have any idea how close you have to get to someone to stand on their feet? You have to get up right in their face, right up in their grill. And, and I don't know, here's the lesson I learned the hard way. If they weigh more than you, it might not work as well. So anyway, they were picking on me, they were bullying me, and I went up right up to one of these big goofs, and I stood on his feet. Now I'm this far away. I could have kissed him. That wasn't my plan. That's how close I was. I stood right on his feet and pushed him. Guess what happened? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing happened. He was a big lord. I pushed him like this. He thought I was a pick in a fight with him. I, you get the picture. You can see it. You know, I go up, I push him like this. So he goes and plows me, punches me right in the face. I fall to the ground. And he loosened all my front teeth. I went home. They were all bleeding. I'm looking in the mirror. And I'm thinking, you know what? This is not my game. This is not my fight. I am not fighting. You know that was the last physical fight I ever got in my whole life, 12 years old? I learned that lesson. I thought, why would I fight on their grounds? Why would I, why would I stoop to their level? I'm going to take on their brawn with my brains. I was going to fight them with my wit and my mouth. Uh, when I say my mouth, I mean not my teeth for them to punch. I mean the words that come out of my mouth. And the beautiful thing about fighting with your wits is you can do it from a distance. <laughs> and you know what? I've been doing it ever since. <laughs> and you know what? It's just the truth that the good fight that the scripture talks about here is not what we think it is. See, I always used to think this. I always used to think that the good fight was, the only good fight was a fight you win. 
And that's not true. Here's what a good fight is. You ready for this? The good fight is a fight worth fighting. It's not a matter whether you win or not. It's whether it's worth taking on, whether it's worth fighting. That's what the good fight is. The good fight is described in Paul's writings in Romans chapter 12. He tells us what the good fight is. He doesn't hear, but he tells us there. He says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with what? With good. That's the good fight. The good fight is using good to fight the battle. See, the good fight is declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ to a world that is lost and dying without hope, without Jesus. The good fight is defending the infallibility of the word of God. The good fight is sharing the goodness of Jesus with a world that doesn't know their right hand from their left hand. The good fight is fighting for justice for those who don't have justice and righting wrongs. The good fight is, is loving the unlovable and caring for the hurting. The good fight is leaving this world a better place than when we found it. That's what the good fight is. The staff gets it. I hope everybody online gets it. You know what? The church has been fighting the good fight for 2,000 years. And you know what? We don't always win it. Let's be honest. We don't always win it. Sometimes we get beaten up. Sometimes we get, we get thrashed really well. And Jesus told us this. He said, you're not always going to win it. He said, you will have tribulation in this world, but be a good cheer because I have overcome the world. What is he saying? He said, don't worry about it. I already won the fight. Jesus wins the fight. You don't always win. Our job is to just fight it. Who do you think is running the food banks and the, and the soup kitchens and taking care of the homeless downtown? Who do they think is doing that? In every single city around the world, it's the Christians that are doing this. Who is it that's visiting the prisoners in prison? You know, even the AIDS crisis, you know who's on the forefront of that? You know who set up the AIDS hospices around the world? More often than not, it was the church, even in our own city of Winnipeg, it's the House of Hesed run by Christians, and Church of the Rock was one of the first people to sponsor them. And we've been doing it right from the very beginning. The church has always been there. Who do you think is taking care of the, the orphans around the world and building these orphanages? And we put hundreds of thousands of dollars towards that because the church understands that's the good fight making our world a better place. You know what, the world, they don't understand who it was that founded public education in Canada, for example. Just as one simple example, it was Egerton Ryerson, a Methodist preacher who decided that only, only the rich getting the education was wrong, and he established the public school system. People forget that the higher education institutions around the world, particularly in North America and in Canada, were actually founded by the church and Christian people that believed that people should have higher education. In Winnipeg, the, the U of W, the U, University of Winnipeg, was originally called Wesley College, named after John Wesley, the reformer, and was a theological seminary. So in, in 1903, there was a brilliant uh, academic by the name of Albert Schweitzer, and he was a theologian, he was a musician, he was a scholar, scholar he was a university professor, and one day he came home and his housekeeper had left a magazine open on a particular article on his desk that said this, the needs of the Congo. And in this article it talked about in the Congo in Africa in 1903, the gospel had not come, modern medicine had not come, and there was people dying left, right, and center from all kinds of diseases. And when he looked at that, in that moment, God spoke to him and told him, you need to go to the Congo. He had no intention of going to Africa. He had no intention of being a missionary. And he wasn't even a doctor. But he decided to take the next 10 years. You, you want to talk about catching the call. The next 10 years, and he went to medical school so that when he went to Africa, he would have something to offer the African people. He was so passionate about it. Imagine this. He was already done his career. He was already on track as a, as a professor. And the university fired him because they felt like he was off. And people kept on saying to him, Albert, you've got a life here, you've got a career here. Let somebody else go to the Congo. And he said, who's gonna go? Nobody's going, if I don't go, who's gonna go? So he spent 10 years getting ready, he packed up him and his family and moved to Congo in 1913. And he set up a clinic in a chicken farm, an abandoned chicken farm, right smack in the middle of the Congo. And in that place, he started to bring modern medicine to the local people and to preach the gospel to him, and he worked there for the next 40 years of his life. And at the end of 40 years, he had 72 buildings. 
He had uh, ministered or, or, or given medicine, medical treatment to 6,000 patients every single year, and the death rate in that part of Africa was lower than it was in Europe. He had transformed it almost single-handedly. Now, the world took notice of this, and in 1952, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. And so then in 1953, they wanted him to go on a world tour and talk about what he was doing. And here's a man that had spent his whole life, whole adult life basically in Africa. And now all of a sudden he's traveling around the world and talking to crowds. And there's a fantastic story about when he arrived in Chicago. And so he got there and the train pulled in and it pulled into the station. There was a big crowd of photographers and they, there was flash bulbs going off. And he got off and he was coming down the steps of the train. He had this bewildered look on his face. And he was looking at all these people and didn't know what to do with all this attention. This is not who he was. And then while this was going on, and he was about six foot four, and he stood above the crowd most of the places that he went, and he saw this little black woman struggling with her bags to get them off of the train and to get down to the bus. And he said to this crowd of reporters, he said, could you excuse me for just a moment? And he walked over and he grabbed these, these bags of this lady and he walked the whole length of the concourse, loaded her on the bus, put her bags on the bus, bid her a good day, walked all the way back to the, where the reporters were standing, and then he turned to them and said, I'm sorry, I've kept you waiting. And then they all felt super awkward about this and started looking around for people's bags to carry <laughs> because they, they wanted to be like him. Now here was the whole point. He was not putting on an act. This is who he was. And you see, what happens is God gets a hold of us and he transforms us into these people that begin with the end of mind. We're focusing on what's down the line and how we're, our, our call is to make a difference in our world. Now, here's my reluctance and the risk of telling a story like this is that people always get the idea that, oh, so you, I should you know, go to the Congo or I should go to India or Africa or the Samoan Islands or somewhere. And we sometimes think in order to fulfill our call in life, we have to cross the ocean, when in fact all you have to do is cross the street. Your mission field awaits. It's right across the street. So I want to give you a more local homegrown story to kind of bring it down. And th this is the story of Linda. And we met Linda in the church a number of years ago, and she was a typical soccer mom, just as unassuming as you would ever imagine that a person could be. And she used to work downtown, and when she was working downtown in her part-time job or whatever it was, she would come out at the end of the day and she'd notice that in her particular area of downtown, the Albert Street area in those days, the prostitutes would be coming out on the street around dusk. And she noticed this and her heart was broken and thought, who's sharing the gospel with these prostitutes? Who's taking care of these people? Who loves these people? So she decided to single-handedly she was going to go down there, and she brought some coffee, and she just went down there and started going down the street talking to prostitutes. And at first, they were very reluctant. You know, they were, why are you talking to me? Why are you bringing me be coffee? But it didn't take long, Linda very long, and their hearts were softened, and it would not be unusual for them to be sobbing on her shoulder and telling a life story, because almost without exception, they come from abused backgrounds, almost every single prostitute. It's part of part of the this, this, this scene in that world. And she became very effective, and she started inviting people, and so she invited me and Kathy, and we started going out on Friday nights with her. And we would, at church on Sunday night, we had a Sunday night service, and, and people would stand up, and they would t tell the stories about what was going on downtown on Friday night, and people all wanted to join, and and it didn't take very long before we had dozens of people. And uh, it's sometimes hard to find a prostitute. Because that sounded bad, didn't it? <laughs> but sometimes it was hard to find someone to minister because there's so many of us. And I'll remember, never forget, my mother phoned me up one Friday night. And she says, can I come with you? And I said, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll pick you up on our way. So we go to pick up my mother. And when we arrive at her place, she comes out of the house. And she's wearing a fur coat and fishnet stockings. And I said, Mom, why are you dressed like that? She said, I thought we were going to minister to prostitutes. I wanted to blend in. I said, you don't blend in by looking like the oldest hooker on the street. 
And so anyway, she wasn't going back to change, and she got in. I kept on looking at her. She had all this makeup on. I thought, she's ridiculous. And so, so we, went, we went downtown, and, and so we're on the streets, and I got an, my eye on my mother the whole time because I'm worried about her. I thought, what's she going to get herself into? So I always was, you know, within half a block of her, and, and so I saw her over there, and there was this prostitute standing against a lampstand, and she was just waiting for John to come along. And my mother goes up to her and says, excuse me, we're supposed to be down here uh, talking to prostitutes, and I know you're just someone waiting for a bus, but I can't find any prostitutes, and I'm wondering if you'd mind if I talk to you. <laughs> to which this woman, and I'll give her the name Lola, which wasn't quite her name, uh, Lola says, oh, sure, you can talk to me, and this is not a bus stop, this is a lampstand, and yes, I am a prostitute. And so at this point, I see my mother engaged in this conversation, and I said, Kathy, you better go over and help my mom. Either rescue my mom or rescue this prostitute, one or the other. <laughs> you never know how it's going to play out. So Kathy goes over there, and, and by the end of the night, my mother and my wife had led this prostitute to Christ. And then Linda came along, and Linda I, mean, I don't even think about these things, but Linda did. And so Linda said, where are you staying tonight? Found out where she was staying and realized she was at risk where she was going to go home that night and uh, that this wasn't good and she needed to get out of this lifestyle. She's going to have... And Linda goes and invites her to her home, says, you're coming and staying with me. And I remember she got in, in Linda's car and Linda took her home to St. Vital where they lived and spent the night. And next day, uh, two days later, she was in church. Two weeks later, she was water baptized in front of the congregation. Two months later, she volunteered to go on a, a mission trip of young people. And on this mission trip, she met a young man. I'm making a long story show, short. She met a young man and married the young man and went into the mission field. This woman that had been on the streets just a few months earlier. And that was, 20 years had gone by because she was on the mission field and I never saw her again for 20 years. And then one Sunday morning, I was preaching right here. And I came down these steps and as I was standing there, this woman came up to me with these two young men beside her, her obviously her sons. And, and this woman came up to me and she said, Pastor Mark, do you remember me? And I went, I'm sorry, I meet a lot, a lot of people, I don't remember you. She said, I'm Lola. You met me on the street 20 years ago. And I just started to cry, like I'm maybe going to right now. And I just started to cry that there she was, and I embraced her, and, and we hugged, and we caught up for a moment. And then she introduced me to her, her two handsome young sons that she brought into this world. And I thought, you know what, this is what it's all about. These moments of when someone's life is transformed and changed. And, and we didn't have to cross the ocean to have that moment. We crossed the street. We crossed town. And God encountered this woman and met her on the street and changed and transformed her life. And these wonderful children came into this world as a result. And see, that's what happens when people, the passionate prevailers, when they fight the good fight. So the first thing is we fight the fight. We don't win it. And the second thing is that we finish the race. That Paul says he finished the race. He didn't say he won it, won it, right? He just, you just finish it. So I have a great story to tell you. So in the uh, 1988 Olympics, there was a, a sprinter, actually 400 meter sprinter, if that's a sprint, a runner, and his name was Derek Redman. And Derek Redman was favored to win the 1988, he was a British runner, favored to win the 88 Olympics. And uh, when he got into the blocks, 90 seconds before the gun, he realized that his Achilles tendon was too far gone and he wasn't going to be able to run the race, and he pulled out the 1988 Seoul Olympics. So disappointing for him. And then over the next four years, he encountered eight surgeries on his Achilles uh, tendon, and he trained as hard as he could. And when he came back in 1992 for the Barcelona Olympics, he was now again favored to win. He goes into his heat, he has the fastest in the heat, he wins his heat. Goes into the quarterfinals, he wins the quarterfinals. He's now in the semifinals, and I'm going to show you the video. Because it, it, I actually tell a story in my book, A Greater Passion, but to see it in the video is incredible. And so I want you to see the semifinal race and see what happens to Derek Redmond. So here it is. 
Uh, here they are, they're in the start, 400 meter semifinal. They're off, he's in the blue trunks there, the blue shorts right there. And uh, he's running, he's actually, you, it's hard to tell because it's on a curve, but he's doing really well. And 150 meters from the end, uh, tragedy strikes, he blows his hamstring. And he blows his hamstring right out and he falls to the ground. He's in absolute excruciating pain. Uh, you can see him, uh, he's just in big trouble. It's actually torn. The race continues, there's winners. Everybody else has already finished, he's done, and he's sitting there. And before the race, he had told his dad this. He said, I don't care what happens, but I am finishing this race, win or lose. He gets up and he starts to hop on one leg to the finish line. His father, Jim, is standing in the stands. He jumps out of the stands, his father, and comes running over to him. And he puts his arm around him and he helps his son. The crowd by this point, there's 65,000 people in Barcelona, watching this race, and they're watching this man's father help him across the finish line, dead last by a long shot, and he walks him across the finish line. You can see the crowd is on their feet. They're clapping, they're cheering. He walks across the finish line, and he gets a 10-minute standing ovation. He did not win the race, but he finished the race. And you know what, here was the ironic part of this story. Nobody actually noticed who won it. Who came in first, second, or third. And years and years later, that was 1992, years and years later, uh, it's still regarded as one of the greatest Olympic moments of all time. And see, the key in all of this is that we're not actually called to win the race. We think we're called to win everything. We're not called to win everything. And sometimes you just need to redefine the win, don't you? and say, you know what, I'm just gonna leave the results up to God. So the first thing is this, is that we need to fight the good fight. Secondly, we need to finish the race. You don't have to worry about winning it. And then the most important thing is you gotta keep the faith. You gotta keep the faith. And you know, to me, one of the great tragedies is when I see people who knew Christ, when I see people that were in the church, when I knew people that were serving God that have somehow been drawn away by the allure of the world and have lost their faith, to me, it's the greatest challenge. And that's why Jesus on the Mount of Olives said this to them. They said, you're going to suffer all these things. You're going to face persecution. You're going to face tribulation. But he says, he who perseveres to the end, they will be saved. And he challenged him. He said, don't give up on your faith. You're going to face a lot of things. You know, it's interesting because a lot of the book, A Greater Passion, is based on the life and teachings of King Solomon. And if you go read the book of Ecclesiastes, it's interesting. It's his most introspective work, and he's in his, his, his senior years, and he's reflecting on his life, and he's reflecting on his failures, because the scripture says this, that, that Solomon loved many women, and his wives led his heart astray after other gods, and he was not faithful to the Lord. That's what it says of King Solomon. And then you read about him, and he says, I looked at the work of my hands, and I hated my life, and I despised what I had done because it was all vanity and grasping at the wind. And many people think that what had happened with King Solomon was that he ended up losing his faith completely. But if you go read the very last chapter in the book of Ecclesiastes, the last thing he wrote, it's in chapter 12, and he says this. He says, remember the, your creator before the silver cord is loosed. He's talking about before this life ends. And he says, before the dust returns to the ground where it came and your spirit returns to the Lord who made it. And you know that what he was having was this moment. And he's saying the most important thing for any of, and all of us is that we would remember our God. And the greatest tragedy, I'll say it once again, the greatest tragedy is when people lose their faith. And if, even if we don't change the world, and even if we don't make a big difference in this world, there's nothing more important than this. Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? And I implore people who have once known him to come back. I implore people that know him now not to let the world draw you away and get you sucked into that because he who perseveres to the end shall be saved. We can all be the passionate prevailers because greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. And if God be for you. Who can be against? God bless you all. Pastor Mark's second book, A Greater Passion, is now available. Passion is the fuel for life, 
and the key to pursuing our potential. If you have ever wondered if you could get more out of life, then this book is for you, filled with inspirational stories, laugh out loud humor. Visit churchoftherock.ca now to get your copy shipped right to your door. Thank you.